Brace yourself. So this is year four for the annual month dedicated to the apex ape of gaming himself, Donkey Kong. And we've finally come to the transition into the third dimension. Honestly, I've been a bit anxious to cover this game because this is a complicated one. Donkey Kong 64 has become what is arguably the poster child of everything bad about 3D collectathon platformers. It marked a turning point, a revelation of the subgenre's most irritating inherences. It killed the collectathon. That's what we've been told, right? Well, like I said, Donkey Kong 64 is a complicated game, and I'm not just speaking about its 5 Kong lineup of playable characters. It's by far one of the most controversial of Rare's N64 offerings, one whose modern reception has become quite the turnaround from its initial response. The game was next in line for a stellar collection of all-star titles, continuing to stand amongst the era's pantheon. Rare was on top of the world in 1999, riding high after multiple Smash successes and numerous genre revolutions on the Nintendo 64 alone. Rare's consistently excellent track record was kind of shocking at the time. They always had something new in the lab that was sure to set the bar high. The studio conquered the platformer genre alone with Banjo-Kazooie, a game that to this day is regarded as one of Rare's crown jewels and a standout title of the generation, one I've discussed plenty of times on this channel already. My early years as a video game fan left me totally infatuated with practically every Rare N64 platformer, and unlike the DKC games which I didn't play in depth as a kid, Donkey Kong 64 was a game I have some actual history with. I can't tell you how many times I played the game on the Nintendo 64, scrounging for collectibles and inching further and further to total completion. In my experience, I could see that it's a part of gaming history, one whose reception has definitely morphed and shifted as the years went on. As I mentioned, Donkey Kong 64's reputation has soured considerably after its release. With its avalanche of pickups and segmented gameplay, Donkey Kong 64 is now kind of a joke, a far cry from its excellent critical reception in 1999. And these issues were not sparse observations. The game's creative director, George Andreas, in an interview with GamesRadar, expressed regret in the game's design decisions, basically running down the laundry list of Donkey Kong 64's most irksome qualities. From the number of collectibles to the swapping of the characters, the desire to refit Donkey Kong 64 into an overall better game was not some fleeting thought. It's admirable to see developers look back on their old creations and wonder what could be done to improve them, especially under the umbrella of critique. It's something any great creative can and should do, so I can't help but be fascinated by the could-have-beens of Donkey Kong 64's development. The collectathon could have been better. But I think we're missing the point here. Collectibles were everywhere in Donkey Kong 64, yeah, but I think the inner essence of the game's controversial reception is by no means limited to, there's too much stuff. Don't get me wrong, that does matter, and ignoring it doesn't make much sense when critiquing Donkey Kong 64 as an artifact, but it's not the full picture. Despite the game's positive critical reception upon release, Donkey Kong 64 always had problems. Problems that add up to a game that kind of needed to be received as it eventually would be. More than 20 years later, many of us are reflecting on Rare's most daring and scope-heavy platformer of its era. And that shining luster that made DK64 so impressive at the time is starting to flake off. Childhood nostalgia set aside, I think it's time to really give Donkey Kong 64 the critical look that I think it deserves. Donkey Kong 64 right out of the gate was a stylish game. It made a very good first impression, and to this day, it holds up remarkably well when it comes to aesthetics. The hilarity of the DK rap created a dumb, almost viral jam that would be remembered for decades to come on Meme Fuel alone. But despite that cheesiness, it did a good job presenting a sort of tone for the game. Character models are extremely expressive, the squash and stretch of their animations are excellent, giving each Kong a totally cartoonish vibe while the Kong's abilities and traits are detailed throughout the rap verses. Even better, the background instrumentation changes during each Kong's verse, complementing each character's style and tone. I'm 
not trying to give the DK rap some it's deeper than you think perspective, but it does introduce the Kongs in a surprisingly attentive way. It's great getting to know the whole team in such a short but very memorable segment. Once the game begins proper, we're reintroduced to King K. Rule, DK's arch nemesis, who has a dastardly new plot to level DK's home into the ocean. His blastomatic laser cannon is primed and ready to fire at the island, while DK's primate pals are locked away by K. Rule's troops. DK is warned by squawks about his friend's disappearance, along with the captured banana horde, and it's up to the heroic ape to save the day once again. K. Rule, at first anyway, comes off as a monstrous supervillain, which is a far cry from the clownish humor that emitted from him in both the Donkey Kong Country games and the infamous DKC cartoon show. It admittedly took a while for me to adjust to K. Rule's sinister new vibe, including the voice acting, but he becomes easier to laugh at throughout the game when his cronies continue to flub up their roles and their incompetence begins to test his patience. Really, despite a darker introduction, Rare did a great job in showing the circus that is K. Rule's Kremlin crew, finalizing in one of the best, funniest, and most memorable end bosses in Donkey Kong history. And even when you make it into the game, Donkey Kong 64 oozes personality, channeling the same honed sense of style that made the older games so memorable. The graphics push the Nintendo 64 to its limits to create some excellent lighting effects, especially in stages like Angry Aztec's Caves and Fungi Forest's Shacks and the characters still retain their cartoonish charm, even down to their walk cycles and attacking animations. This is a much more atmospheric game than Banjo-Kazooie, richly demonstrating some of the best the Nintendo 64 can muster, if only for a platformer. The music has also made quite the change, both from Donkey Kong games of the past and older rare projects on the system. Iconic N64 composer Grant Kirkhope handles the music themes for DK64, and like the graphics, there's a stronger drive toward atmosphere here. While many of the tracks do have some memorable jingles, Kirkhope focuses on more unique tones and moodier tunes. This definitely shows in the themes of Gloomy Galleon and Crystal Caves, two stages who sensibly lack upbeat vibes, choosing for more subdued and even experimental contexts. Frantic Factory's eerie wind-up effects and buzzing noises can be downright unsettling as well. But I can't ignore the bouncy joy of Jungle Japes, a theme song that truly channels the classic Donkey Kong Country game's vibrant and exciting musical styles. Aesthetically, there isn't much to complain about. Donkey Kong 64 really is eye and ear candy. But like every game, there's much more to it than looks and sounds. If the gameplay doesn't hold up, During the move to 3D, Donkey Kong 64 adopted many of the tropes of what would eventually become synonymous with the collectathon platformer. Super Mario 64 had already laid the groundwork for how platformers could and would play in a 3D space, but Rare Zone Banjo Kazooie is what really drove the exploitive intrigue of the collectathon subgenre. It set the standard high and shaped the curious mindset that would drive players to scour every nook and cranny for items and secrets. Paying close attention to environmental cues and understanding how a player's moveset operates under the conditions of three dimensions. Rare managed to challenge even Nintendo themselves in making a 3D space inviting and almost mesmerizing in its little intricacies. There was just so much to find when given that tool set. So Donkey Kong 64 had a tough act to follow. Rare had to up the ante even more. After the Super Nintendo trilogy put the ape back on the map, it was time to bring the now renewed Donkey Kong franchise into the third dimension. In the wake of Banjo-Kazooie's success, there was a lot of discussion going on in how to bring Donkey Kong's world onto the Nintendo 64 while also setting it apart from previous 3D platformers. In the Games Radar interview, Andreas described the pressure of distinguishing Donkey Kong 64 from Banjo-Kazooie by populating the worlds with more and more collectibles, at the word of Rare's co-founder Tim Stamper himself. 
While Donkey Kong Country had already begun to focus on collecting items in the 2D space, as shown in DKC 2 and 3, DK64 made it as key a mechanic as possible, and with more to collect, the more fun to be had. More is better, right? Well, the collectible count definitely made Donkey Kong 64 into a bigger project, one with a lot of ambition behind it. Its focus on collecting items has become outright mythic, I'd even go so far as to say it's a running joke for the game, a legacy that's also wormed its way into the history of the genre's downfall itself. The menus alone work overtime to show just how many items are out in the world, and surprising no one, this great big world has a lot to find. Maybe too much. To the game's credit, the worlds feel spacious and more intricate, a considerable step up from Banjo-Kazooie's. But while Banjo-Kazooie had sensible collectible placement to make each level memorable and easy to explore, with worlds as big as Donkey Kong 64's, creating pathways for the player to follow definitely feels like an afterthought. Every bit of the level needed to be filled to create a cohesive, inviting world, but in order to do that, Rare wasn't able to organize the collectibles to give the player direction toward key items or abilities. The placement doesn't feel natural, and makes the game too scatterbrained to be fully engaging. It's more distracting than anything. It also doesn't help that some important collectibles require some more obtuse methods to access, especially across multiple Kongs exploration. Five Kongs means five times the pickups, forcing the player to collect certain items as a specific character. It doesn't take much to see how this can unnaturally divide the game, pushing players to constantly switch characters back and forth just to grab some items. It's not hard to see the issue of that design direction. The segmentation of Donkey Kong 64 has been brought up time and time again. And while the collectibles and their placement are of noticeable issues, I would argue that they're far from Donkey Kong 64's fatal flaw. Donkey Kong 64 has a large cast of playable characters, stepping things up from the tag team duo mechanic of the Donkey Kong Country games. Expanding the Donkey Kong team to five characters was, much like the rest of the game, ambitious all around, but most of the intrigue comes from actually finding and rescuing DK's friends. For example, Jungle Japes has you rescue Donkey Kong's pal Diddy, and once you manage to collect everything you can as Donkey Kong, it's time to hop in the tag barrel and switch to Diddy Kong. While there are minute differences between the two series veterans, they mostly play the same. They can run, attack, jump, swim, all the staples. Now, to be fair, this was the case in the original Donkey Kong Country. Donkey and Diddy were pretty much on equal ground, but their minor differences gave each character a layer of depth, one that served the game's goal of tight, engaging platforming. Diddy holding the barrels of chest height had its own advantages, just as DK's larger weight had its own perks. These differences had large ramifications within the context of the platforming. In Donkey Kong 64, however, Donkey and Diddy's differences are simply ways to gate off content from one Kong or the other instead of providing some distinctive gameplay changes that serve the game's mechanical goals. Donkey Kong's coconut shooter is used to hit coconut switches and open doors. Diddy's peanut popguns do the same, but with peanut switches. The solution is apparent, and there's no sense of discovery in these situations you're just following the level's prescribed checklist. Really, this is one of Donkey Kong 64's most prominent problems, and it's introduced so early in the game that it becomes immediately clear how ingrained it is into the design. The issue isn't necessarily that the game is so fractured and segmented across the different characters. Having that happen can be interesting, as it encourages players to think on a macro level, requiring them to look into the entire toolbox when approached with a challenge. As a result, I'm not against the tag barrel at all. Multiple characters can make for some fascinating depth when applied creatively, even when you have to relocate yourself to switch out. The fact that tag barrels restore your health is another benefit to having them, so on the whole, tag barrels don't destroy the game's pacing. The problem though is that these divisions are performed in such an artificial way. Hitting a switch with a character's face on it or shooting a target that only they can shoot doesn't make for engaging gameplay. It doesn't require the player to think about what to do or how to do it. There's no examination of the toolbox. Even worse is that this can lead to game design that's broken off from environmental context. A level doesn't have to do much at all to accommodate something like a switch. No ingrained assets, no algorithm of effects. Just a switch that, when pressed, has something happen, regardless of what the level or its aesthetic demands. Just a year before Donkey Kong 64 was released, Banjo-Kazooie had already hit a home run on providing puzzles that couldn't be done without a native, appropriate environmental context. 
Moves were frequently tied to the level design. A beak attack opened doors, talent trots let you climb steep terrain, eggs could be used to attack enemies. In Donkey Kong 64, a switch does something. It doesn't matter if the switch is in one place or another, when pressed, it'll do something. And whether that actually makes sense within the context of its location doesn't matter. In a genre where constructive world building is so essential, using such arbitrary design directions is a very easy way to break players' immersion. They want to feel like the world is alive, but when the solutions to the puzzles are so artificial, telegraphed, and lacking in custom woven elements, the game world suffers instantly. In Donkey Kong 64's defense, some situations do a better job. For example, using Diddy's Chimp Charge attack to hit switches in the Jungle Jape's mine is clever. A bit simple, yeah, but nothing simpler than what was found in Banjo-Kazooie's earlier stages. It also preserves platforming as a focus, as you still need to jump up the treadmills to reach the entrance to the minecart challenge. And yes, Banjo-Kazooie's grunty switches did do the same thing, but those were ways to connect the hub world to the main levels. They had a clear purpose there. I also like techniques like Lanky's Orangistan or Tiny's Ponytail Twirl because they're tied to the character and can be used anytime, not only when near a random pad or switch. These techniques' utility is also telegraphed much less overtly, as steep slopes and large gaps at least conceal that utility a bit, if only mildly. However, as the game progresses, the game falls back on the artificiality of character-specific pads and switches. As I said, these are easy ways to have things happen in games without worrying about environmental context. They aren't omnipresent, but they are very clearly used as a crutch in many instances. Furthering this, Cranky Kong also introduces character-specific barrels, giving characters unique abilities that activate when they jump in a barrel with their face on it. Donkey Kong gets invincibility, Diddy gets a jetpack, Tiny shrinks in size, etc. The quality of these abilities ranges from interesting and creative to situational and undercooked. Diddy's jetpack opens the door to some expansive exploration for items and some pretty compelling navigational challenges from NPCs. Donkey Kong's Strong Kong invincibility skill, on the other hand, is used in very specific regions of the map in some extremely telegraphed implementation. In fact, when you see a barrel, it's the same issue as the switches. You know what character you need. I mean, yeah, there's a bit more flexibility and mystery based on where the barrel is located, but some of the barrels are so close to where the ability is required that it's practically impossible to think otherwise. Also, the fact that these operate on energy provided by crystal coconut pickups is another limitation that's pretty arbitrary and only slows down the gameplay. The ring minigames that Diddy does, for example, have crystal coconuts set to infinite during the minigames, so I don't really see the point in adding more collectibles for moves that'll, for the most part, be used in these specific instances. Some sections even automatically negate special barrel use when you venture beyond the allowed boundaries, which is a much easier method of keeping the abilities from being abused. The Crystal Coconuts just never made much sense to me. Well, outside of the totally OP shockwave move you get from the Banana Fairy Queen, I guess. And yeah, there's the Banana Fairies. And the Battle Crowns. And the Orange Grenades, Banana Metals, Secret Coins, there's just so much here. And yeah, cry heresy if you feel, but all of these additional items and secrets to find, they're actually kind of okay. Many of them are like mini side quests incentivizing the player in a specific way. These types of challenges are diversions, but they're fun diversions. They make DK's world feel gargantuan and rich with things to find. When moving away from artificial segmentation and the lackluster pathmaking, Donkey Kong 64 is compelling. Sure, you still need to get banana metals, blueprints, and stuff like that as specific Kongs, but during those fleeting moments where the game lets go of your hand and encourages you to just explore the worlds, no strings attached, that's genuine captivation. But these moments just aren't around enough. There's such a strict, rigid design direction permeating Donkey Kong 64. These little divisions add up to so much, and their brief moments of freedom just can't shine through. As for the boss fights, they're a topic of contention for me, because as clever and aesthetically wild as they are, they don't provide much substance. The first two level bosses are practically identical and totally forgettable, but Frantic Factory manages to deliver a boss that doesn't just provide a good platforming challenge, but also takes full advantage of the player character and their defining skills. Nimbly gliding from platform to platform using Tiny's ponytail twirl demonstrates exactly what a boss fight in DK64 should be, one that fleshes out character distinctions and gives them a chance to shine. 
To a lesser extent, I could say the same for Fungi Forest's boss, and I admittedly have a soft spot for Creepy Castle's boss. Yeah, it's a cutout of K. Rule, but it's just so damn goofy that I can't help but laugh. Too bad the actual fight isn't that compelling. The credibility of the boss fights definitely reaches a high point with the final fight against K. Rule, whose multi-phase battle lets all five Kongs use their unique abilities to take the big guy down a peg. Barrel blasting his Donkey Kong, rocketing to shoot lights down on his head as Diddy, these are simple but effective ways to give a kind of greatest hits of the entire team's skills. It sums up each character's style well, letting you revisit their advantages in the context of taking down the guy who's been causing so much trouble throughout the main game. It's a great wrap-up. This was a tough pill to swallow. Donkey Kong 64, a game that really made my childhood, had totally supported the claim of the collectathon's singularity, the negative extreme where what you collect outperformed how you collect and why you collect. It's a game so rich with personality, charm, and humor. When looking at its aesthetic, there's so much to love here. Stylish environments and characters, a surprisingly progressive music composition. It feels like the natural step for the Donkey Kong Country series into 3D. But the game is so taxed by its rigid design, with so much to collect by so many specific characters, it was already a lingering problem, but that problem was exacerbated by levels that were artificial and lacked chances for genuine discovery. I couldn't help but wonder what the game would be like if all of the switches, pads, and barrels were gone, and the game instead had handcrafted, fully customized assets for each level in their place. Not just a unique NPC or two, but level elements that are custom woven to the cloth of each stage. Players could get curious at what the Kong's movesets could be used for within the context of the level, and better yet, with enough complexity, these puzzles could justify using all five Kong's special abilities to complete them. But that curiosity, the idea of giving the player the tools they need, but letting them figure out solutions on their own via appropriate design cues in the level, it just isn't in Donkey Kong 64. So much is signaled so blatantly that the argument is closed before the player even gets a word in. If you see a barrel with a character's face on it, what else is there to do? You have the answer right in front of you. Since DK64, the Donkey Kong series has experienced new life under Retro Studios, but the gameplay style of Donkey Kong 64 was largely ignored for the franchise and was starting to fade away entirely. The series never again revisited the freedom of a fully 3D collectathon, and that's kind of a shame. The entire subgenre has undergone a resurgence, with some games having better quality than others. But there's clearly a demand for these kinds of games nowadays. It makes sense to bring them back in one way or another, and Donkey Kong could easily fit into the mold once again. Of course, Rare is no longer with Nintendo, and Nintendo themselves have their own 3D platformer series that takes the spotlight these days. But you can't help but wonder what Donkey Kong's legacy could have been if Donkey Kong 64 turned out differently. 3D might have become the series' bread and butter, even in 2020 if that happened. Would we even get 2D Donkey Kong games anymore? I don't know. Either way, it's fun to think about. Coming to terms with nostalgia is something I've discussed a lot on this channel, and when it came to the collectathon genre, Donkey Kong 64 was kind of the medicine we needed to take. It's a sobering game, one whose flaws are so transparent, but its potential is near limitless. And that's why I can't in confidence say that I hate this game. Because I don't. Potential and quality are not synonymous with each other, but a game's potential can deliver a new perspective, a way to see what the game could have been. Of course, the quality never lived up to that potential, and we shouldn't ignore that, especially when the game displays its problems so openly. So, if a new 3D collectathon, Donkey Kong branded or not, manages to show its face, I'm hoping the devs can see the potential of this game and this genre. I'm not looking at Donkey Kong 64 20 plus years later for nothing. Take it to the fridge, Cranky.